Hello and welcome to the Moss Adams Virtual 2023 Building Opportunity Conference. We're pleased that you've all joined us today. And before we begin, I'm gonna play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today, we'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our group CPE attendance sheet available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, uh, this is the first of five sessions in our 2023 Building Opportunity Conference. We've added a link to the conference sessions in your handouts window, so hopefully you can join us for those as well. Today's topic is challenges and opportunities affecting the future of cities. Urbanist and author Richard Florida will discuss how living and working in and around cities will impact how we view the urban experience in the years to come. And now I would like to hand it over to today's moderator, Chad Averall. Chad is the leader of the National Construction, Real Estate, Hospitality, Restaurant, and Professional Services Practice. He has been in public accounting for over 20 years and provides accounting and business advisory services to private and publicly held companies. Chad, over to you. Thanks, Amy. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. As Amy mentioned, my name is Chad Averill and I'm an assurance partner at Moss Adams and, and have the pleasure of being the industry group leader for the great team we have here at Moss Adams. I wanna welcome everybody to the first session of the Moss Adams 2023 Building Opportunity Conference. I'm excited to introduce Richard Florida as the presenter of our first session. Richard is the world's leading urbanist and international bestselling author of Rise of the Creative Class. He is a pioneering researcher in University Professor at University of Toronto. He is co-founder of the Atlantics and now Bloomberg City Lab, the leading publication devoted to cities and urbanism. He is founder of the Creative Class Group, advising companies such as BMW, Audi, Starwood Hotels, Facebook, Instagram, Converse, Microsoft, and several others. Richard serves as a board member with many of the leading real estate, urban innovation, and venture capital firms across the globe. Please welcome join me in welcoming Richard Florida. Oh, thank, thank you, Chad. Thank you, Amy, and thanks to Moss Adams, and most of all, thanks um, to all of you to, for being with us today. Um, as Chad said, my name is Richard Florida. I've, I've been working in this field of cities and urbanisms for quite a long time. I actually got very interested in this as a, as a young boy. Um, I was born in Newark, New Jersey, um, and when I was a little boy, it was a great, fantastic, diverse, thriving city, the kind of thing that the great author from Newark, Philip Roth, writes about. 
But, you know, when, when I was a young kid, maybe 10 or 11 years old, um, actually, my dad worked in a factory in work. My dad only had a seventh grade education. He was a factory worker. His factory began, a, which was a thriving eyeglass factory, began a long slide and decline, ultimately shut its doors some years thereafter. And Newark exploded into civil disobedience and racial unrest. Um, I witnessed it with my own eyes. And I think that's when I caught the bug, decided to study this in college and went on to graduate school. And I'll tell you, um, I think we are living through probably the greatest changes in the nature of cities and how we live and work of, of all time. I mean, like all of you, I wasn't I wasn't prepared for the what the events of March 2020, the, the onset of the COVID pandemic. And I immediately began a deep study of the effects of, of crises like pandemics on cities. And it's very interesting after you know being in this field for many decades having gone to graduate school and got a PhD in this field, uh, having taught many students, having written many books, uh, read a ton. I had never seen much commentary on the role. In fact, even, even my mom and dad, my mom and dad were both born in the 1920s, but they were the youngest of, of large Italian American families. Um, so it means most of my aunts and uncles, and certainly my grandparents, lived through and survived the Spanish flu. Now, those folks love to talk about their experience of the Great Depression and go on and on about how hard it was. They, my dad would talk about his, his service in World War II, certainly traumatic events, but the Spanish flu was never mentioned. It's often called the forgotten pandemic. So there wasn't much conversation or discussion about it. So beginning in March, 2020, and since then, I've been trying to understand initially how the pandemic would reshape not just our cities, but our suburbs, our rural areas, how we live and work. And and also what I've come to conclude is it, it it's not so much that the pandemic has reshaped our world. I think what it did, and you know, it's funny folks, I didn't know what Zoom or online connection was in March of 2020, and here we are, you know, doing this whole conversation online. We had to learn new ways of communicating, new ways of working, new ways of expressing ourselves. And what that did is it accelerated an ongoing set of transformations in our cities, in our communities, in our offices, and how we live and work, and kind of put them on speed dial. And, and what's funny, you know, I, I've written quite a few books. I wrote this book in, in about 2007 or 2008. It's called Who's Your City? And, and the subject in that book was, was why the, the place you choose to live is the most important decision you will make. And, and the way I opened that book is I say, you know, my, my dad told me, uh, I work in a factory. You really don't want to work in a factory. I work in a factory so you don't have to, Rich. You go to school. You study hard. You go to college. You get a degree. You become a professional. That's the way to a better life. So, so I had this orientation about education and career. Lots of advice out there about that. My mom, you know, who, who had a higher EQ and was an incredible loving person said, you know, your dad's absolutely right, Richard. But, you know, I did go to high school. My family did have a little bit more money. My dad, your grandfather was a small businessman. Many of the, the young men I dated went on to professional life. They were accountants or financial professionals, doctors and lawyers. But I really fell in love with your father. And I didn't care that he had a seventh grade education. And yes, we struggled, but we had two sons, myself and, and your brother, Robert. And, and so make sure you pick the right partner or spouse. But what I came to conclude in that book is that whether we're talking about where you get an education or where you go to school, the career opportunities that are open to you and the professional networks that might come to your disposal, the people you can befriend or date or partner with or marry, they all have a relationship to and are dependent on where you live. And when I wrote that book, oh, it, it sold pretty well, but nobody really cared. When the pandemic struck, all people wanted to talk about, you know, here I am four decades in, all people wanted to talk about where should I live? Where do I move? Where do I go? How do I get more space? What does this remote work thing mean? And that's what I want to talk to you today about how that's caused me to reshape the way I think how it's caused our cities and communities to change, what they might look like in the future, how are we living and working differently, and what are its implications for the way business conducts itself and, and picks and chooses locations. So 
straight away, let me share some of my, my key findings and takeaways. First of all, you know, when, when the pandemic struck, if we can cycle back in our minds, there was an outpouring of pundits and predictions that we have seen the end of cities as we know them. I, I don't know if you remember this, but the newspapers and news magazines and the online websites and the television news were, were pictured of empty New York City, empty London, empty Paris. And the idea was that because cities were dense, because they were crowded with people, because many of these cities were so hard hit uh, by the first wave of the COVID pandemic, people would abandon cities to never return. Well, as soon as I began my studies and I went back and read the history of pandemics and infectious disease and of great other disasters that have, that have affected cities, great plagues, cholera epidemics, Spanish flu, uh, terrible and deadly things, you know, great crises, hurricanes, fires, storms, floods, wars. What I realized is, is that they can slightly affect the trajectory of, of the so-called force of urbanization. But this force of urbanization over time is a much greater force, this infectious disease. And, and, and I guess the way I want to put it to all of you is that this thing we call urbanization, the gathering together of human beings in communities and settlements. There were, were first small settlements. Then there were larger cities. You could walk their parameters. Uh, then they began to add industry and factories and trading centers and office districts. And then we invented uh, transportation and trains and subways and, and then cars. This force of urbanization, the clustering of people and business and activity in cities and their metropolitan outskirts, their suburban and rural outskirts, is a far, 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 far stronger force than any infectious disease or, or calamity, natural crisis, economic crisis, or conflict. And to just put this in context, in 1800, not that long ago, less than 3% of the world's population lived in urban areas. In the year 1900, when my grandparents were cro cro crossing the Atlantic from Italy on a ship, Less than 15% of the world's population lived in cities or metropolitan areas, urban settlements. In 1950, after World War II, it was 30%. Today, over half the world's population lives in cities and urban settlements. And by 2050, 75 or 80% will. That means we will have over 7.5 billion people because of the projected growth in population. As population surges then to about 10 billion people, we'll have more people living in uh, cities and urban set settlements in 2050 than populate the entire earth today. Another way of thinking about this is in 1900, not that long ago, my grandparents were coming to America. There were just 12 cities in the world with more than a million people. Today, there are 400 cities and or metropolitan areas, urban settlements with more than a million people. More than 60 have greater than 5 million and 25 have more than 10 million. And, and the point is, that our cities, these dense clusters of human beings and their economic activity, have long been not just the centers, people call them the, the greatest invention of human civilization. Of course, that's true. They are the productive and innovative and creative engines of our world. Uh, the great Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Lucas, in, in an essay he wrote and receiving the, 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 great pro, the, the Nobel Prize, said, if you want to understand the nature of economic growth and development, it all comes back to cities. Cities are where talented and creative and ambitious people go to find their calling. And, and when you bring them together, the effects are far greater than the sum of their parts. They are the places where talented people come to make a difference, where the ambitious come to launch their careers, and where ideas come to mate. Uh, if you look back through all of human history, if you take the densest human settlements of the day, you know, in early civilization, these dense little communities are where we started to invent modern language, to speak to one another, where we began to implement simple tools and, and make tools out of natural materials, or where we started to communicate using cave drawings and paintings. That said, and what I want to talk to you today is that the pandemic has accelerated. It has really put into motion a set of changes in the nature of cities, in the nature of our suburbs, in the nature of our rural areas, in the nature of the global community and network of cities 
and in the ways we live and work that have been building up for a couple of decades. And here's, I guess, the most important part of it. For, for all of human history before us, we, we created our wealth as human beings out of things that were very physical and very tangible. Um, we worked on farms and, and we worked uh, hunter gatherers and then in farms. We, we harnessed the fertile soil. We used our backs and our bronze and animal labor to help us become more productive. And in the agrarian economy, the farm was really the organizing unit of that, that economy. Well, you know, up until about 1800, most people worked on farms or supporting farm work. Today, in the United States or Canada or Europe, about 1% of, we still make a lot of agriculture, but about 1% of our workforce works on farms. And then came the Industrial Revolution. And, and I think the Industrial Revolution convinced us that the force that was really transforming society and moving us forward was industrialization, that it was industrialization. And, and really, in the industrial society, it was the factory and the large corporation that was the organizing unit. You know, my dad, he started work in a factory in Newark at age 13, that eyeglass factory called Victory Optical in the down neck or ironbound section. Uh, he took four years off to go serve in World War II, and he stormed the beaches at Normandy and formed, fought in all those great battles. He came back from the war, and he went back to work in the same factory where he worked until that factory closed when he was in his 60s. When I was a boy, IBM, people used to refer to IBM not as international business machines, but I've been moved. You, you, you worked with a company more or less for life, and, and you went where the company told you to go. So the farm was the organizing unit of the agrarian economy. The factory and the company was the organizing unit of the industrial economy in which I grew up. But today, in a knowledge economy, and, and another, if, if only 1% of the workforce works on, on farms, Less than 20% of our workforce today works in blue collar work like my dad worked in. Uh, but that includes delivery people and warehousing people, logistics people, the people who come and bring stuff to your house, the people who work on your car, mechanics, construction, all the people who do physical work, blue collar work, like my dad did. Um, less than 6% of the workforce actually works in a factory. The, our economy has transformed into an economy where it's no longer raw materials and physical labor, which are the driving forces of innovation and economic growth, where the brain has become the means of production. Think about all of us online today. We are what the great theorist Peter Drucker called, and by the way, he did this in the 1950s in a study of all companies, General Motors. He argued to the board of General Motors, and I don't think they agreed with him, that General Motors was no longer an industrial concern in 1950. That General Motors had become an knowledge economy dependent on innovative management ideas, innovative strategic planning ideas, innovative engineering and research and development. And that's only accelerated. And a couple of more statistics for you from research I've done. I dub this group of people who work with their minds um, the creative class. And when I say the creative class, I mean a group of people who use their minds as the means of production, who use their knowledge and information and human creativity to make things or do their job. That includes scientists, technologists, innovators, and great entrepreneurs. That includes artists and musicians and designers and entertainers, people who power that part of our economy. It includes people like us who work in the professions of higher education or education broadly, accountancy, finance, management, in healthcare, and the law. That group of people composed less than 10% of the workforce in 1900, less than 15% of the workforce in 1950, less than 20% of the workforce in 1980, about the time I was graduating college. Since that time, in the United States, we have added 40 million jobs. 40 million new jobs in this creative class or creative component or creative sector of the economy. Now, nearly 65 million Americans do these creative class jobs, as I said, in science and technology, business and management, arts, entertainment and culture, and the professions. Over 40% of us, it is the largest single class of workers, and that happened last year, 
in our economy. Now, if you take metropolitan areas or cities in their satellite communities, or if you take countries in Northern Europe like Sweden or Norway or Copenhagen or places like Hong Kong or Singapore, but if you take metropolitan areas like the San Francisco Bay Area, Washington, D.C., Boston, Cambridge, college towns like Austin, the North Carolina Research Triangle, Ann Arbor, Boulder, Colorado, Columbus, Ohio, you've got nearly 60% of the workforce in those metropolitan areas being composed of members of the creative class. And it's not just high-flying, high-tech, big cities or college towns. Baltimore, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, St. Louis, Cincinnati, Providence, Des Moines, Birmingham, Alabama, Oklahoma City are all in the top 20 large metropolitan areas over the past decade for growth in the creative class. So we have become an economy powered by knowledge. And what's interesting, interesting in that is the platform of that economy is no longer the farm or the factory. Cities have replaced farms and factories, these clusters of human beings in and around communities, central cities, their suburban periphery, outlying rural areas. Our cities have become the fundamental platform or social and organizing unit of this knowledge economy. They are the places that bring people and jobs together. They are the places where knowledge gets generated. They are the place where new musical ideas or artistic ideas or creative ideas or new innovative ideas or startups are generated. And, and in this, a key factor is no longer just the quality of my life, it's the quality of the place. The quality of the place, and not just the job it provides, the excitement, the energy, the, the number of jobs, the thickness of the labor market, your ability to access other people, the networking effect. If you're a young person, the ability to date and meet people and make friends, all of that becomes key to winning this competition for talent. Because the key in the knowledge economy isn't just access to raw materials or physical labor, it's the ability to amass talent. And the pandemic, if anything, has accelerated that shift, meaning that places that attract and retain the talent win and it empowers us, the members of the creative class, because it gives us more choices on where, because of remote work and digital connectivity of where we want to live and how we want to work. And I don't think we're ever going back to the old ways. So first question out of the four, and I'm going to try to do the questions up front and then we'll roll through the remainder. Um, first question, in the aftermath of the pandemic, Places like Austin and Miami have been seen as the emerging, high-flying, high-tech startup hubs. To what extent have they drawn a substantial share of venture capital investment and these high-tech startup companies away from the San Francisco Bay Area? Let's just see your answers. Is it true that these places have drawn, Austin and Miami, these high-flying tech hubs, have drawn a substantial share a venture capital investment in high-tech startup companies away from the Bay Area. We'll give it a minute. Getting there. I don't want to give away the answer. It should be on your screen, no? It's on my screen. I see a question from Shannon. And 76% of folks have answered. 78%. So it should flash up pretty quickly. Some people are saying it disappeared before they could answer. But it looks up. Now, and the answer, and it's not a trick question, is false. And here's why. It is true, absolutely true, that Austin and Miami have increased their share, uh, increased the number, uh, the, their level of investment, their level of investment, and have increased their number of startup companies, and that there have been some relocations of startup companies from the Bay Area 
to those places. But over the course of the pandemic, the pool of venture capital has grown so much. I, I say it, it, this geography of this new age is spiky. It's not flat. It's clustered and concentrated. Just three regions of the country, the Bay Area, the Boston, Cambridge area, and New York and Washington, D.C., and Southern California, that Boston, New York, Washington corridor, account for more than 80% of all U.S. venture capital investment in startups. In the last quarter, San Francisco has actually increased, increased its venture capital funding. And to many, it is now becoming, once again, the home of the next frontier, artificial intelligence. Now, that said, um, I want to talk just briefly about the way the pandemic has affected where we live. And here, the effects have been much more subtle than most people think. Over the course of the pandemic, 60% of all moves have been within the same county, and 75% of all moves have been within the same metro. Our growth in the post-pandemic age highly correlates with pre-pandemic baselines. And, and here's a question for you. I'm going to give it a little bit more time to come up. Given the effect of the pandemic, which of the following cities tops the list as being the most unaffordable for the average person to buy a house or an apartment or a condominium? Is it New York? Is it San Francisco? Is it Los Angeles or Miami? Now, it is very clear that the pandemic has had a big effect on the movement of people out of dense cities to suburbs and rural areas. What happened, I think, is pretty clear. A lot of young people moved to cities beginning in the year 2000, and a lot more moved after 2010 to take advantage of those job opportunities, the clustering of high-tech industries, the movement of high-tech companies to cities, the jobs in finance, insurance, real estate, and entertainment, the fun and the, the excitement, the energy and the amenities, the nightlife. But those kids were growing up. If they moved in 2020 or 2010, by the time the pandemic came around, they were 30 or 40. And so they had families. And what remote work enabled them to do is they could move out to the adjoining suburbs, but they could move to rising cities like Miami or Nashville or Austin, or they could move to these Zoom towns like Hudson, New York, Hamptons, Bozeman, Montana, Park City, Utah, Traverse City, Michigan. So let's see what you said. How are we doing? Oh, we're almost there. Believe it or not, when you look at the cost of a median house to median income, the most expensive and unaffordable metropolitan area in the United States today is Miami. And, and that's because housing prices have gone up, but housing prices may still be higher in the other three, but incomes are not as high. And in these highly desired neighborhoods, uh, parts of Miami or parts of Nashville or parts of Austin, where the New Yorkers and San Francisco's and people from L.A. want to live, those walkable, pedestrian friendly or urbanized suburbs, if you will, prices have gone through the roof. Uh, so the correct answer is Miami. And, and one of the things the pandemic did is people spread out because these places are much smaller than in New York or Los Angeles. It affected the housing market much more. And Miami became now. I'll tell you the, the second, the third question. With remote work providing so many options for work, cities like New York are no longer big draws, the biggest draws for young, talented techies, creatives, and professionals when they graduate college, true or false. So if we talk about the pull factors that shape cities and metropolitan areas, there's a countervailing factor. It's a push factor. There are pull factors that pull people out. There are push factors that push people back. And what we've seen throughout history is that after pandemics, young people are the ones that start to come back to cities. Older people, more frail people, people with families and children often move out, decamp. Ever since 2010 till 2019, young college grads between 25 and 34 years of age accounted for more than half the population increase in urban areas. So let's see what you said. Did yeah, we're doing pretty good. Getting better at the question thing, folks. Mm -hmm. 
very close. The fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that we're getting a demographic divide in our country, more so in our country than in European countries or Asian countries. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Our urban areas are not as family friendly. The schools are not perceived as quite as good. There tends to be more concentrations of poverty, higher rates of crime. So that families tend to decamp to the suburbs. But young people, especially ambitious young people, have headed back to the city in droves. And that's why rents are so high. Rents are at record rates. And really, they're heading back to the biggest city. You know, I often say to myself now when I talk to my nieces and nephews, you know, why are you all moving to New York City? The talented, ambitious young people in our country, don't get me wrong, they'll go to Washington, D.C. if they're interested in public service or L.A. if they're interested in entertainment. But you've never seen so many young people head to the, to the big city. And this is our fourth question and last question. So thank you for, for taking time. I love these. We spent a lot of time thinking about them. I'm going to shift from talking about where we live to where we work, because I think the biggest impact of the pandemic is not on, it has had subtle effects, families to suburbs, young people back to cities, but that's been going on since I've been born. Um, and it's it certainly enabled people to move from the low, like my dad, he, he moved from Newark, New Jersey, when my mom and dad moved from Newark, New Jersey, to a suburb three miles away, North Arlington, New Jersey, exit 15W on uh, the Garden State Parkway, or on the New Jersey Turnpike, sorry. And, uh, you, you know, where, where he could get a small house, he perceived, my mom and dad perceived there were better schools uh, to raise a family. Um, so suburbanization is a long growing tent. But here's the question for. Uh, as remote work has emerged and has enabled more of us to work like this, ultimately that was a short-term effect. And here's the question. The central business districts, the office corridors of large city, will ultimately be fine as more and more companies call people back to the office, true or false. So what I want to say to you is that as the pandemic has had this effect on where we live, certainly causing families and this demographic bubble of young people who moved back to cities in the 2000s, to say, look, we've, we've got to find more space and, and schools for our kids and we can spread out. And, and although that it didn't radically change our geography, it stretched it a bit. The much bigger impact of the pandemic is on how we work, that this shift to remote work has been enormous. You know, now there are numerous competing estimates. So I'll give you the best ones, I think. Work from home, which is about 1% of the workforce, or work, remote work, 1% of the workforce 20 years ago. If you take 2019 as the benchmark, if you give it the best, the biggest estimate you can, about 5% of people work from home. Now, post-pandemic, overall, it's at least 10%. It's at least 15% of highly educated college grads. People estimate that 20% of work days across the board are done from home. And, and so it's between 10 and 20 percent. 50 percent of all work is hybrid with people working remotely or from home some days of the week. Just 40 percent of work, and it probably was as much as 90 or 95 percent before, is on site five days a week. The average, according to the best student of this, Nicholas Bloom, an economist at Stanford, the average is 2.8 days in the office, 2.2 days from home, with lots of people in in the middle week, and pretty dead days on Mondays and Fridays. And the reality is that our, our work situation is hybrid, blurred, and blended. It's not one thing. And we have multiple work sites. I have an office at the university. I'm talking to you from what was my, uh, eld my, my youngest daughter's bedroom, which we converted into a study. And, and sometimes people work from other spaces. They have not only a work from home office and a central office, Nick Bloom has done very close surveys of this. He's actually surveyed the people who work from home. So the people who say they work from home, they don't work from home. It's so funny. 20% of their time is, 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 is taken up in a place we call as urbanist a third space, a cafe, a coffee shop, a restaurant, a library. 15% of the time, they'll go occasionally to a co-working space near their home or if they're in the downtown of a city, They'll go to a court, and 10% they do work in a, in, a, in a friend's house. Almost done? Oh, man, this is great. Another great, great answers. Um, well, I'll get to this, but, but I, I, I wouldn't quite call it. It's a gray area in between, but false is closer 
to the truth, central district business districts are being very, very, very challenged and are going to have to reinvent themselves. And that's what I want to talk to you about in the next few minutes. How that transform, because that's the big transformation. It's not so much the movement of people out of cities, into cities, young people in, older people out, looking for the burbs. What we're seeing is a real revolution in how people work and a big transformation in, in the role of the office and in the downtown. Now, if you, if, you, if you look at the basic barometers of return to work, this castle barometer, if you look at Nick Bloom, who I mentioned at Stanford, his work and others, across the board, we are looking at an office occupancy in our center cities, in our, not office occupancy across the board, but in our center cities of our major cities at about 50% of the pre-pandemic trend. Now, my colleagues at the University of Toronto, working with others at the University of California at Berkeley, have tried to get a gauge of how much activity is going on in downtown. Not just people going to work, but, but people going to restaurants, to bars, to nightlifes, to sporting events, people who live downtown and are walking around. So the way they do that is they use cell phone data to track people. They found that there are a couple of cities, two or three cities, that are more than 100% recovered. Salt Lake City, Fresno, small, Bakersfield, California, El Paso, Texas. They find there's a group of cities that are about 50 to 90% recovered, on track. Columbus, Ohio, Las Vegas, San Diego, Washington, D.C., New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Charlotte, Austin, Houston, and places like Chicago, Detroit, and Pittsburgh. Uh, some of the Western ones and the Southern ones are a little bit more recovered. Uh, and some of the Northern ones a little bit less recovered. But there are a group of cities like San Francisco and Portland and Cleveland and Toronto that have struggled a lot more and are still struggling to recover. But the point I want to make is, is in many ways, this thing we call the office district, where, where we pack and stack people like us into, into vertical towers you know, nine to five skyscraper canyons filled with these cubicle farms that in many ways, they're the last relic of the industrial age. You know, first the farms started to, to close down and move outside and go to bigger plots. And, and actually, if you look at the most concentrated industry in the United States today, it's farming, heavily concentrated in areas of California and Florida. Um, if you look at industry, you know, industry, our cities, all of our cities used to be jam packed and our waterfronts used to be industrial areas with factories and smoke belching and railroads and active ports, very, very little of that left. It's boutique, artisanal manufacturing. That all moved away in the 70s and, and 80s and maybe into a little bit in the 90s, and it moved offshore. It moved to suburban areas. It moved to the Sun Belt. It uh, moved to Alabama and Kentucky and Mexico and China and Vietnam. Well, the last vestige of the industrial age was the packing and stacking of, of people like us in an office. Why? We were wired. We were tethered to our desks. My phone had a wire. My computer had a wire. My assistant was in the other room with the pink little thing that told me somebody I had to return a call. There was a typing pool and then a, a word processing pool. You had to be close to people to talk to them. But this move to digital technology has kind of untethered us. And so, you know, I, I saw this early on in the pandemic when I made a visit. I'm, I'm a, from New Jersey went to school in New York. We long kept an apartment in New York until the pandemic struck and our, when our kids were little. So I know the city really well and I went back and, and what I saw was people lining up dressed in business attire. The offices were black, you know, the lights were out, but people were lining up in business attire at 445 for every bar and restaurant. And, and what I concluded that everything in the city was back, the restaurants, the arenas, the stadiums, the theaters were full except for the office. So what's been happening in our cities is we've seen this ongoing shift in what we call the central business district that's occurred over the past 20 or 30 years. In fact, I have a book on my shelf by the guy who wrote the history of downtowns. The title of that book, and I'm looking up at it right now, so I'll get it right, is Downtown. It's Rise and Fall, 1880 to 1950. By 1950, the greatest historian of downtown was saying downtowns were over. Well, what happened was the growth of that creative class and the knowledge workers and the knowledge industries created a little bit of a reprieve and brought downtowns back. But, but the trend was away. 
So urbanists like me have been trying to come up with a name. It's no longer a central business district. It's a central entertainment district. It's a central cultural district. It's a central recreational district. It's a central innovation district. It's a central social district. But, but here's what else has been happening. And, and Fogelson, this guy who's written about it, shows over the course of the past century or century and a half, our downtowns have morphed and changed as industries have changed. And they become less about office work and more about entertainment and culture and more about it, recreation. But the other thing that's happened, which I find interesting, is that the central business district began to expand and morph. The tech companies didn't go to the office towers. The, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons. Amazon started this in Seattle when it took over the old hospital initially in downtown Seattle. Uh, Google, when it started to look for, it, it did a survey and asked its people in the headquarters in Silicon Valley, where do you want to live? And they were amazed that so many people said, we want to live in New York City. So they took over the old Port Authority building and the new building is on the riverfront, uh, on the waterfront. And if you look at you know where uh, South Lake Union in Seattle, you look at Chicago and River North, look at Toronto, these companies began to migrate, not, into, not away so much from the, center, the office district, but in areas adjacent to it, where all these trend, where the, where the bohemians and the hipsters and the creatives and the artists used to be. And so the central business district was already expanding. And of course, what we saw after 9-11 in New York was the remaking of the financial district, not Midtown, the remaking of the financial district. I just stayed there with my family, uh, away from just an office area, but an area with housing, with hotels, with hospitality. And now, you know, you look at what's happening down there. My wife is on the board of a, of a nonprofit art gallery center that's in the Freedom Tower. You know, we took our kids down on the waterfront and went walking down there to the carousel and they enjoyed themselves immensely. You look at that new performing arts center, which is considered one of the great new buildings in, in New York. Uh, never mind, you go to Chelsea and, and the areas adjacent where Little Island is in the High Line Park. And now, you know, uh, adjacent to the High Line, you look at Hudson Yards with this new building architecture building with all the plants coming out up called uh, the spiral. So the central business district was kind of shifting its boundaries. But, but, but what's happened and what's so interesting is we used to think of downtowns as about office workers. Well, a new study is coming out tomorrow, and I have a preprint of it, that looks at the downtown, the effects of downtowns across about 25 or 30 big cities in America. You know, office workers are, account for about 25% of the activity in our downtowns today. Now people will say, well, we're going to convert those offices to residents. And I think that's a great way you can convert the building, where it's amenable, where it has the right windows and infrastructure. About maybe 20, 20%, 25%, maybe a third can be converted. But residents, if you take all the people in the downtowns, on average, are about 15%. Visitors account for 60% of downtown activity. So what we are beginning to see is a shift in the nature of our downtowns and our cities from centers of production and work. My great friend, Ed Glazer, leading urban economist of our time at Harvard, identified this as the rise of what he called the consumer city. A sociologist at the University of Chicago called it no longer the city as a production machine, the city as an entertainment machine. Uh, Ed and another fellow, an Italian architect who's at MIT, just wrote a masterful essay in the New York Times. They call it the playground city. The city has, it, it's so interesting to me. It's, 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 yes, there's work that goes on there. And yes, there's people living there. And yes, there's young people there. And yes, there's offices that are 50% full and 65% full in the middle of the week. But the idea of the city and its, and its salvation, if 60% of it is tourists, is more as a center of amenity, more of a center of consumption, more as a center of playground. And this I find really interesting, you know, because I am a child of the 60s and 70s. You know, I'm a baby boomer, if you will. I grew up at a time when nightlife was the big deal in cities. And when I started to write the book, The Rise of the Creative Class, around the year 2000, and I started to talk to these young tech kids I was teaching at Carnegie Mellon at the time, coming out of Carnegie Mellon or MIT or Stanford, and I was asking them about nightlife. They would look at me like I'm a little strange. And they'd go, no, yeah, we like nightlife, but we, we don't want to go out and just eat and drink and, and get blitzed. 
And the word I heard come up, we can't afford the recovery time. We're working, we're, we, we're engaged. We're, and you know, I thought about it and like, my dad wasn't a big drinker, but like when he came home from working in the factory, the last, you know, he'd crack open a, with the old can opener, a can of beer and put on his team, whether it's the New York Knicks or the New York Giants or the New York Yankees. The last thing my dad wanted to do was exercise. What these young people wanted to do was go for a bike ride or go for a walk or play ultimate frisbee or play soccer, whatever, whatever it was, was their thing. And this, this, the city was not only a consumption of goods and services, it was a consumption of experiences. You know, somebody said the other day to me, a city is a landscape of experiences. A great city is a landscape of different experiences and wellness and fitness. And, you know, I, I looked at this one day, I was walking in the streets of Soho, you know, and I was getting up, I was honestly getting up to go to a spinning class. And all of this area that used to be fit, filled with bars and nightlife and all night places to eat, don't get me wrong, there was still some of that. But there was nobody staggering in the street with a cigarette. People had a green juice and, and you know, and a Kai bowl, and they were going to Pilates and yoga. And, and, you know, now you hear people going down to the waterfronts to do these sunrise socials and to do cold bathing. The city was shifting in ways no one could fully understand. And, and really, the downtown's becoming much less of a center for work, per se, and much more of a center of entertainment. And, you know, I've been studying this. I've been looking at the rise of the destinations, looking at the rise of the attractions, looking at what's happened in London and New York as those old waterfronts have turned into these magnificent, you know, in the adjacent areas, the Highline parks, all of these areas that have been transformed. And I was just looking the other day, and it's not a waterfront, but I'm not, I'm not like a Las Vegas person. I'm not a conceito person. I'm not a gambler. I go, but Las Vegas has spent a lot of time brilliantly, I think, repositioning itself as less of a gambling mecca and much more of a place for people to go enjoy shows, music, to connect for big conferences. And I noticed the sphere. I don't know if you've noticed this, the sphere, this new performance venue with supposedly, I haven't gone, incredible acoustics, but the outside of it, you know, all of these LED lights, it's this round globe that's incredible. And U2 was doing the first residency there. Of course, Adele does a residency in another room. But the point was these destination attractions become so appealing to people. And, and that's the kind of thing whether it's sports stadia or arenas or music or iconic architecture or the opera house in Sydney and now Oslo and Hamburg have built their own, the giant Ferris wheel in London, the movement of the major art gallery and theater in London to the waterfront. The city has become a center of experiences and entertainment. And, and my own theory of this, and the one thing I would revise of my own research when I wrote that book, Rise of the Creative Class, the subtitle of it introduced a phrase that's been used ever since, and how it's changing the way we work, live, and play. Cities are not just places to work, live, and play. What the pandemic showed us is the real function of cities is not as a container for work, not as a container for living, not as a container for shopping. The real function of a center city and its adjacent areas is as a platform for human connectivity. So I'd change that. I would say in, with bold letters, cities are places we work, live, play, and connect. And folks, we have a survey done by the architecture firm Gensler that asked people about a year ago, what do you want in a great downtown business or office district? Largest category of answers, 70% restaurants, cafes, and social venues. Second in line with 65% parks and open spaces, 50% shopping, 45% theaters, performance spaces, entertainment venues, museums and cultural venues, historics and cultural landmarks, all ranked significantly higher than offices at 35%. We are social animals. We require connectivity. We do not stand isolated very long. And that's what our great cities and central districts are about. Now, I've been writing about this and trying to look at the city of the future. And um, with some brilliant consultants at, at BCG who have access to incredible data on business talent flows, we are completing an essay, and hopefully we'll complete it in the next couple of weeks for the Harvard Business Review, on what we think this new kind of city means and what it means 
for business location. And what we're finding is astounding. What we believe has emerged is a new kind of city that we've never seen before. It's a new kind of city with new kinds of implications for how we work and how corporations think about their locations. Um, for all of human history, and I've said this before, it's even, it's even more fundamental than I thought. For all of human history, cities were physical aggregates or physical clusters or, or physical geographies. What made a city was its ability to cluster human beings and human knowledge and human productive capability and farming and industry and office work together. Now, as we added technologies, the boundaries of the city grew. First, we had a very small city whose city limits was limited by our ability to walk. And that might have been a mile or a little more. And then as we developed horse-drawn carriages and added railways for the carriages, the cities began to expand. So New York began to expand. Philadelphia began to expand. London began to expand. Boston began to expand. Outside of that original harbor front zone, to these new areas. And in New York, people said, oh, we could start to develop Central Park and a grid system up to Central Park and beyond it where housing. And then we developed rail technologies and railroads to move people and goods. And then subways in, in, in Pittsburgh, where I live, there was a gondola, a vehicular going up the mountaintop. We began to develop these new technologies and cities began to spread out. But still, met my dad, even when he worked in the factory, in the 30s and 40s. My dad used to walk to work in Newark. And maybe he'd take the bus occasionally, but he mainly walked to work. Then as we invented the car, with the invention of the car, we could spread our, our cities out miles and miles and miles. We could develop suburban areas where my folks moved to. We could develop edge cities, like these, these secondary business areas that emerged. We could develop shopping malls and those really hurt the downtowns of places like Newark and other cities as, as shopping malls developed, as people exited cities. And, but even then, if you look at the way our government or statistical agencies define an urban area, it's called a metropolitan area. A metropolitan area is a physical zone that's a shared labor shed or commuting zone. Its boundaries are literally defined by how people commute how far people commute back and forth to work. But digital technology, this thing we're using, is reshape is a new powerful form of technology that is once again reshaping cities. The city of the future is no longer just a physical cluster. It's a physical cluster that is supplemented in its ability to expand by digital connectivity. So the obvious implication of this is people can move from the center city and from the adjacent suburbs where commutes might be 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, a half an hour. And people were commuting. They could move out further. So what you see is that the fastest growing areas of the New York metropolitan area, and this stands for almost every large metro, are the outlying areas. The Hamptons. My wife and I went to visit the Hamptons this summer. It's now becoming a year-round community and the schools are filled. Uh, Hudson River Valley communities, which used to be recreational places in summer, the Catskills. And, and every, we've seen that in Michigan, when we go to visit in Michigan, you know, Traverse City, we could go on. So they've enabled people to move not only to the center city and close in suburbs and commutable suburbs, but far afield because they're only going to work once or twice a week or, or less than that. But they've also enabled people to move outside the metropolitan area before. 25% of those moves over the course of the pandemic were to new metropolitan areas. So what we've done is created a new name for this. We call this new kind of city a meta city. And it's a city which is a combination of a physical cluster, digital connectivity, and a virtual agglomeration. It's a physical and virtual cluster. 
And we use data on talent flows from LinkedIn, most of you are probably members. We look as a proxy measure of this at the cities people are moving to and from. We could look at a number of Zoom connections. We probably could look at the number of fight connections, but we believe this is the best indicator. The number of people, people are moving cities to and from. And, and here's what we find. People think that Miami and Austin and Nashville are the new kids in the block and that they're taking jobs and people away from established cities like New York, San Francisco, and LA. But what we find is something which we believe is much more sensible, that all these cities are connected, and that the best way to think of Miami is as an affiliate or a satellite of New York's finance, insurance, and re And if you look at the talent flows, that's what you see. It's a New York-Miami connection. The best way to think about Austin is as a satellite of the San Francisco Bay Area Tech Hub. And for years, the leadership at Austin has been recruiting technology companies, at working with technology companies and talent, and saying, come to Austin. We offer our less expensive housing in a higher Nashville, I'm doing a ton of work in Nashville right now. Nashville looks like a, an entertainment complex and a music scene, and now Reese Witherspoon and Nicole Kidman have moved there and do their entertainment and film and television production there. It's affiliated with LA. So we, we rate and rank the cities of the world. And what we find is something really interesting. New York and London remain the most connected cities. But if you look at the next group, it's not Chicago and LA and San Francisco and Boston. It's Dubai and Singapore and Dublin. Places that have built up their airports, built up their global connections, built up their quality of life, built up their attractions. Now, they're not attracting so many Americans, but Dubai has become the center of the Middle East work, remote work area. Singapore is doing the same for Asia. Dublin is playing a role, not quite London, but doing something similar for Europe. And for all of us in the business community, and this is what I teach my students, this means corporate location is more important now than before, because it no longer means you can just plop an office in the big city that becomes kind of like your brand statement and your spectacular place. You have to move some work out to the suburbs and even rural areas. You have to take advantage of co-working spaces. You have to help your people better understand that's happening, repurposing suburban office parks and abandoned malls. You have to begin to think about how to do remote work more effectively and ergonomically. You have to think of this system as a hub and satellite system from great urban spikes, which are the center of the connective fiber, to suburbs, to rural areas and satellite metros. Well, I'm a professor. I come from the Fidel Castro School of Speaking. I could go on and on. But the point is, we are living through a huge social and economic transformation. Probably the biggest, if not one of the biggest, if not the biggest in human history. It's a shift in how we live and work. It's a shift in the nature of our cities our suburbs and rural areas, and in the way cities relate to one another. And it's better. It's hard, it's scary, it's new, and it's frightening, but it's better. We have more choice than ever before in how we live and work. And we have the ability to reintegrate for the first time in my life, to put back together the way we live and work and have a little bit more focus or a little bit more ability to spend more time with our families. This shift isn't over. It's an ongoing shift. I've given you my best sense of where it might be headed, but it's clear to me that as we go through this, all of us, our cities, our communities, our offices, our businesses are gonna shift even more and we need to be flexible and understand and adapt as we go. Thank you so very much. I know in the chat, we're gonna have my email, which is florida at creativeclass.com. Please feel free to connect with me. I read all of my emails and answer all of the questions you might send me. And I'd like to hand it over to Amy to close us out. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Richard, for presenting on such an interesting topic today. We really appreciate that. And to our audience, as Richard mentioned, his contact information is available in your console if you would like to reach out to him directly. And then thank you for joining our first session of the 2023 Virtual Building Opportunity Conference. We hope to see you for the next one on October 10th, which is economic update. Has the recession been canceled? If you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. A copy will be emailed within two weeks if you have difficulty downloading it now. And finally, here's a link to an online survey for today's presentation. 
Your feedback is always appreciated. So thank you for that and take care, everyone. Thank you, thank Richard. You. Thank you.